Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anozie Ebigo. I am from the Hel Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our first invited lecture here at this year's Interpol. And our speaker this morning will be Professor Oliver Röhrle from the University of Stuttgart, which happens to be my alma mater. He'll be talking on the topic of the theory of porous media in modeling biological tissues. Uh, before I introduce you to today's speaker, I want to just give you a quick reminder of some of our rules for this online presentation. Number one, of course, as usual, leave your mics muted unless you are called upon to ask a question. How can you ask questions? You can ask questions by one of two ways. Either you use the, um, the Hoover Q&A box, which is just to the right of your of the video screen. You will find a Q&A box where you can type your question. And um, feel free also, if someone else has asked a question that you find interesting, to upvote the question. I will uh, read the questions to our speaker at the end of the talk. You can also raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button and uh, the end of the talk, I will um, call upon you to ask your question if we have time. Then uh, finally, of course, uh, um, recording, private recording of the session of the talk is not allowed. All right, thank you very much. So let's get back to our speaker for today, Oliver Röhrle. He is a professor for continuum biomechanics and mechanobiology and the founding director of the Institute of, for Modeling and Simulation of Biomechanical Systems at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. He holds a PhD in Applied Mathematics from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And his research fo focuses on multi-scale computational modeling of soft biological tissues, in particular on modeling the mu musculoskeletal system. I knew I would uh, have problems with that word. All right, so I am particularly excited to um, uh, hear and see this talk today because, um, um, because it highlights one of the many um, various topics that porous media research um, can focus on as covered by our community. So uh, with, uh, without further ado, uh, Oliver Röhle, the virtual uh, screen uh, stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this kind of introduction. And I hope like as in the practice, you can see my full screen now. Um, so, first of all, they, uh, yes. they uh, warm welcome this morning also from my side and very much a big thank you for the organizers uh, to invite me here to present that lecture here <laughs> on basically in a general kind of uh, theme like in the title. But I want to start off with a slide which is not about biological tissues at all. It's from the aviation industry and I think there why I picked that is Simulation plays a really big role there. Everything is predefined there. Everything is uh, designed there uh, before uh, basically any kind of thing is built. There's hardly any prototyping anymore for the whole plane. They know what uh, the fuel consumption is, how it will behave and all these things. And people would step on a plane for the first time after it has been designed online, the computation tools and so on without any hesitation. So if we look there, the simulations was certainly one of the innovation uh, incubators there. And it started probably from 1950s on, uh, the automotive and aviation industry to use simulations. In the, uh, in the 70s, there was very little simulation, but a lot of experiments. That changed over the, uh, the course quite a bit. And these days, you have a lot of prediction and maybe some validation still there. And if you look what did this done for biological tissue for the medicine, then in this field, we started much later, even though you could see it as an engineering problem as well. And we are much less yeah, likely to use simulations as an innovation uh, incubator for this field. And I think this is um, where we need to change a little bit and where this field here can make a big impact as well. I'd like to start with a slide, where do we come from and where might it be there? So in the 1630s there, way before people started thinking about, well, people started thinking about flying, but before they really did fly, there were the sessions, there was quite a bit of knowledge about the anatomy there. That's a, a drawing from Rembrandt where these people actually paid for being on the painting there, but 
There was anatomy sessions there. And I think we got quite a bit to a much better understanding to have generic anatomic models or really like image-based, like functional examinations as well, where you have uh, not only the geometry, but also some of the function there. And where do we really want to go with that? I think the vision is like to go for precision medicine and subjects to specific treatments. We're certainly far away from that, but uh, and this picture is certainly not from anyone close within the last year or something with all these people on the, road, on the street, but um, that's where we want to go. Everybody is individual. We are certainly no, no way close to that and I won't be able to give you any answers for this kind of problem during this talk here as well. But I think one thing, what it is, is we need to use computers, and that's a picture of our supercomputer here in Stuttgart, the Hawk. We need to have modeling, good modeling, and we need to have efficient simulation technologies to really use this as an incubator for innovation and for driving this field. And maybe to start off, why we use the theory of post media and why we um, do that, maybe some numbers about the humans there. I mean, it's a very much evolved uh, system, like well, the upright gate was an evolution process over millions of years. But then if you look at the bare numbers, what we have in nerve cells, for example, we have 100 million to 1 billion. That's a lot, but it's not outrageously huge number. And the processing speed of 100 hertz is also relatively low compared to other devices what we have. And the signal conduction what we have is about a half a meter to 120 meters per second. So all reasonable numbers, essentially. And particularly if we compare that, what happens over the last 70 years, so it's almost a little bit over 70 years now that Conrad Suse basically presented his first functioning computer, which had about 0.3 flops. So uh, every three seconds, one floating point operation, what it does, we are in our days, we are at the petaflops. It's hard to grasp that number. It's like 10 to the 15 flops. Yeah, I hope I got the name right with quadrillion there uh, in English. It has a humongous number of uh, transistors there, and we have clock frequencies for 3.4 gigahertz and higher uh, compared to the 100 hertz, what we have as a human there. But the human really consists of the support in the locomotion systems of internal organs, the nervous system and sensory organs. It consists about 60% of water, 20% of proteins, 15% of fats. That varies. In my case, it's certainly a little bit higher. 5% minerals and other inorganic materials. We have about 256 muscles and 206 bones in the body. And what interests us really is basically how the tissue or like the, how we can model the, the, the tissues there. And the tissues is a mixture. It's made up of tissue cells what we call extracellular matrix, so it's often collagen, solids uh, for structural support, every single organ, every single tissue has that essentially. Um, we have extracellular fluids like blood plasma for the transport and exchange of substances and the variations really depend and vary quite a bit uh, depending on the tissue, on the age, on the physical condition and so forth. But just to give you some average numbers about the water content of particular organs, for example, the lungs have about 83% of uh, water here uh, as a content. The kidneys or muscles about 79%, and the brain and the heart about 73%, the skin 64%, and the bones, which you might even consider as quite dry, they still have 31% of water there. So altogether, we have a structure, extracellular matrix, for structural support, we are solid basically, but we still have a high water content. So that is really a prime location and we can say the human body is essentially a porous media. And that's uh, where basically where a lot of research, what I kind of present today is also located in our collaborative research center, which is headed by Rainer Helmick here in Stuttgart and our excellence cluster for simulation technology. And I think both of them are fitting with these challenges very well to the goals that uh, these uh, programs aim for. So to start off, I want to pick two applications. As I said, in one application, what I do a little bit more in detail is uh, looking at the vertical uh, uh, at the spine, there in particular, the vertebral spine there. Uh, and we all know as we age, things change, bones are weakening there. And what that means for the vertebral column, we get weaker, they constrict and get flatter. 
you develop something like uh, basically like a hunched forward uh, position there. Uh, this has to do basically because the bones here, what you see, or the vertebras are getting from the top from healthy, always more spongy and more porose all the way to the bottom there. And of course, you can imagine that you don't have the same structural support anymore on the top, uh, on the bottom as you had in, in the top. And if you load that, basically, so there's maybe another view on it. That's what's called osteoporosis and vertebral fractures there. Uh, the bones typically consider out of a relatively hard cortical shell and a, full, and a fairly porous cancellous bone inside there. And osteoporosis is really a skeletal disease that causes low bone density and distributed bone architecture there. And it becomes more brittle, as we saw before, and fractures it more easily, in particular, if we think about putting quite a bit load, load and strain on the vertebra. So there is a high risk of fractures, and that's about uh, here every 22 seconds, and aged 50 and above hit with a vertebra, uh, with a fracture there. So what do they do there? They basically have a, uh, a, a procedure which is called uh, percutaneous vertebrasty there. And that is um, basically, I quickly explain the procedure, what they do basically very minimally, invasively um, insert a needle there. They do inject some bone cement uh, into the damaged fractured area. They want to fill it. They want to restabilize it basically so that you have basic structural support. And again, after you uh, cure these things, uh, the the, yeah, the bone basically hardens out and restores the strength of the vertebra. Uh, the, uh, the intervention really is image guided. You take a lot of, uh, like a lot of 10, 15, 20 maybe CT images or X-ray uh, imaging uh, images to guide how to know how much bone cement you have injected. Because one thing you definitely want to prevent is any kind of leakage there too much, or that you don't have enough there. And this. Um, Procedure basically uh, has quite a great success. Uh, it really, if it has is done correctly, it basically uh, provides you immediate relief in most cases. But the disadvantages, as I said, if uh, improper injections can also lead to uh, the cement outside, you are here next to the nerve canal. That's kind of a problem. Uh, it goes into the bloodstream. Can uh, uh, go all the way in the lung and, uh, and lead to uh, different kind of complications there. One solution is a better training or a better surgical planning tool. And I think we have a computational model that simulates the injection of the bone cement into the porous, uh, porous interior can help quite a bit there uh, in doing that. This is kind of work what we did collaborative in the SFP 1313 our Collaborative Research Center together with the AO Research Institute in Davos. Uh, yeah. So what is uh, what do we do? How does the model look like? Uh, so if you look and zoom in here in an aspect, we have basically one face, which is a trabecular bone. We have one face, which is a bone cement. We have one face, which is a bone marrow there. So altogether, we basically consider in our model like three faces, the bone, bone cement, and the bone marrow. And they abbreviate it basically whenever you see an alpha and an S, C, and M. Then the homogenization there, we can define the volume fractions and alpha, which is the volume fractions of the respective uh, faces. And we have a saturation condition, so forth, that everything together needs to be always adding up to one. So that's a basic sphere. We also allow not only the flow of the cement within the, um, uh, within the porous media, but also consider the deformations of the uh, of the solid phase. So we have basically our standard diagram just with three placement functions here for each uh, phase, basically the M for marrow, C for cement, and S for the solid for the trabecular structure. So we have a point in the current configuration which has different uh, uh, components of the phases and each of them come basically from different points in the reference configuration there. And you have the placement function and you have the um, yeah, uh, deformation there. So that means we need to take this full set of uh, theory of post-media of balance equation, first of all, into account. 
uh, with mass momentum, moment of momentum energy and entropy for the overall aggregate, which is given here. Uh, the energy and the entropy we will first neglect, but it actually plays quite a bit of a role. Because what I haven't told you yet is if you inject the cement, uh, it's basically a PMMA, uh, it hardens out and it has an exothermic uh, reaction and it produces heat and radiates out the heat to the sur surrounding tissue. And you're close to the nerves, so, so you don't want to ex expose the nerves with too much heat. If you get a, a buff, quite a bit above 40 degrees, you might kill the cells and you cause damage there as well. So we will take into later account also the energy there. And we have a constituent balances uh, and relationships for the individual components. So that's with the alpha here, basically for the solid cement and marrow. And we have production, production terms on the right hand side to allow for the interaction between the different phases here. We first make a few assumptions there, and as I said, we first neglect the temperature, so that's why we consider the temperature as constant. That would be maybe more or less similar to the healthy case, where you would have a constant temperature in your body, around 36, 37 degrees. Some of it varies a little bit, but it doesn't matter too much there. Yeah. We assume slow processes, so we ignore the uh, acceleration terms here. And with these kind of things, we can get basically the specific balance relations here for the integrated volume balance. We get the volume balances for the fluid constituents there, and the overall momentum balance as well as what we should fulfill as a Clausius plug inequality. So writing out in detail again is basically what we use for the different mass balances here. Uh, for the solid bone, we use the integrated version. The bone cement, we have this one here there. The saturation condition is always that the volume fractions have to add up to one. Then we have for the moment balance, we have the aggregate here and the two for the bone cement and for the bone marrow here. Um, what we use for the constitutive modeling, we use a linear elastic hook-in uh, model for the solid deformation. There, there's little deformation, but we still want to take into account, so this kind of model is absolutely fine. Uh, we use a brooks corey model for the capillary pressure there. This is given there, and the relative permeabilities can be defined through this one here. I guess what the special thing is uh, about the, the modeling here uh, the cement it is really a non-Newtonian fluid, what we need to, to address there, what we need to model there. So that's where the non-linearities definitely kick in there. We have shear thinning. The viscosity decreases with increasing rate of deformation. We, uh, the, bones, the bone cement undergoes curing, so the viscosity increases with time. So we have a time dependency there again. And we need to think about the upscaling for the shear rate to the macro scale. Yeah, so shear rate is basically something which is giving on the poor scale here. Um, so from a rheological model um, for shear rate dependencies, we adopt the Kari Yasuda model there, uh, time dependence, and for the effective shear rates, we assume a Canela model there. I think uh, I don't want to go all in detail in the interest of time. There, what we want to do, what we need to do is a discretization of the model. And if you take a volume balance and use a deformation dependent finite element as you would do, you use Taylor Hood elements, maybe quadratic linears, or your favorite ones, what you do, what you realize you will end up with a no stable solution, no sharp fronts and the oscillations. So for us, it was not really the option. So we wanted to discard that. And we're thinking about what could we do there. And then we said, well, we could treat the uh, latter part here as a deform deformation dependent uh, part. We can do the uh, finite elements and we can do the first part with a flow dependent one and a box discretization. So if we do the first part of weak form, so that's basically a finite volume uh, um, discretization. And if we have the weak form here of this one, then um, we need to think about what is our volumes and we constructed the volumes over the barycenters of the individual elements so we can integrate over this one and uh, basically link it to the internal points there. 
The uh, discretization here is with linears as far as the def uh, def uh, deformation dependent uh, discretization is concerned. Yeah. Then we use for the time derivative a forward Euler and a upwinding scheme, and the upwinding scheme really makes it possible that we have a nice stable solution scheme uh, for this type of a problem there. Yeah. Uh, so if you have, want to have more details, uh, my PhD student Subin Trivedi and uh, is presenting today at uh, uh, 440 in the Mini Symposium 20. You can visit his talk there as well. Um, so what we have, some images and movies here about the geometry, what we extracted from a CT image of a cadaveric uh, vertebra here. We assume a flow inflow of five millimeters per minute. It's about right. We have about the procedure lasts about two to four minutes, uh, something around that. Uh, we have quite a bit of material parameters uh, here. And then you should see here the movie as uh, basically it spreads in and produces a spheric, uh, spherical. Uh, this is still with isometric permeability in the case. And uh, we have the injection pressures, what we uh, can compute there, uh, which is looking in the form of this way. We did uh, experiments with that. They are mainly conducted at the AO Research Institute in Davos. Um, uh, basically, they did the cement characterization. And what we used here on the left, you see a, a CT image, a CT uh, scanner, which produces a basically of a probe, which is of a pores. We try to be as regular as possible, aluminum foam. For, for, uh, Images of the entire three-dimensional uh, settings. You see here basically two different cross sections there in about 0.4 seconds. So we have a very highly uh, temporal resolution as a syringe is basically injecting the bone cement and, the and that's a real tools here and the real bone cement into the structure and basically records what the forces are. And uh, so here you see basically a movie of how it uh, goes out and if you have a good enough resolution, big enough screen, you see even uh, some of the wobbles as the force structure is there. And the injection force is what they uh, measure to maintain the inflow uh, rate of five milliliters per minute is really um, very similar to what, uh, what we have for the, for the pressure there. Then the, I said we also need to think about that was also isothermal modeling. We need to think about non-isothermal modeling there. We need to add the energy balances also for each of the components and the aggregate there. Um, and uh, the temperature can go quite a bit up. It can go quite above 40 degrees there as well. And that's what we want to do. We, you see here basically a simulation of the cement saturation. So there was injected 10 milliliters of bone cement, I should say. And we have modeled the heat generation based on cement curing. Uh, so on the left image here, you see the volume fractions uh, of the bone cement, blue meaning basically hardly any, and red uh, means about 80% or more of the, uh, um, of the volume fractions. That's the aggregate temperature between 35 degrees and about 60 degrees here. And we take three instant points. So this is at one time instant. And we take three points, the red point, the green point, and the blue point to uh, look at the temperature distributions here over time. And that's basically what you get there. Internally, it's not that uh, bad or not that uh, critical if you get 60 degrees or more. But if you uh, go like to the outside and that's where the surrounding tissue is, where you don't want to damage definitely something, you need to stay uh, in a very low rate. And that's also something which hasn't really investigated much in this kind of problem there. Uh, the last couple of minutes, I just want to give a quick glance. We are not quite as far as using the theory of course media there in the musculoskeletal system, but just to give you a little bit of an insight, this was a picture what I found on the web uh, from like the body worlds where they plasticized uh, the blood vessel system. It's not all, it's just the blood system here. Uh, blood vessels are major ones and not only the smaller ones with capillaries and so forth. So 
the perfusion is the flow of a fluid through a blood vessel or lymphatic cystic system on, in an organ tissue, what we say. It's really important to, uh, to supply nutrition and acids there. Uh, I guess we all know, and without the perfusion, we don't have also effective the delivery of drugs. So if you want to look into that and think about how uh, drugs are working, we really need uh, that uh, there, and most of it really uh, is in really the very fine blood vessels where it occurs in the capillaries there. Yeah. And so what we do uh, quite a bit as well, we model the musculoskeletal system, in particular the skeletal muscles, on various scales. And we typically uh, do that in a continuum sense here. We look in the tissues on homogenization methods and use a lot of uh, biophysical uh, information on smaller scales. And uh, so we build up here um, the constitutive models uh, the, for the, or not the, constitutive, for the, uh, the models, what happens for force generation uh, in terms of a biophysical model. This is what we have. We definitely do that all on the mechanical side. There's a lot of uh, equations, diff partial different, uh, ordinary differential equations here. And we are thinking about right at the moment and uh, doing some work on coupling it to the metabolic system. And the metabolic system then is again linked to the, um, to the um, blood flow supply there. This one is a really big computational problem, what it uh, turns out. This mechanical problem has already about 70, 80 coupled ODE systems. And uh, this one adds probably another 80 to 100, depends on what you detail to that. You want to put that into anatomically realistic uh, features with fiber orientations. We have a lot of fibers there. We can do some uh, uh, part there, basically, where you see the electrophysiology on the muscle on the left and the resulting mechanics on the on the right. And we want to do that uh, when we are in the, on the way, basically coupling that to a force media system as well, because uh, this affects the muscle and the force performance as well. We know if we sit on our uh, butt and then the muscles can produce about 10% less force as we would not uh, have the pressure on the same muscle in the same kind of way. This is a publication where it's a little bit more recent, but where we use this data and where we use basically our supercomputer here in Stuttgart to solve these problems. What is feasible uh, these days, uh, certainly not with all the bells and whistles and with electrophysiology is like multi-muscle systems. That's the first one where uh, agonist antagonist muscle model is basically uh, going for uh, being able to uh, be simulated and that's more or less with what I want to conclude as well. So we have the possibility to include all the contact to do activations in this system and to get motion and movement. We need to extend it that now uh, also to aspects of perfusion. And right now, for example, it has unlimited uh, ATP consumption. And we all know this, this is not necessarily true. Uh, so. I didn't get quite that far with that as we were hoping to, but uh, that's kind of the main uh, picture that gives you, I guess, a little bit in summary, what we have done on the vertoplasty, uh, how to deal with that, how to discretize that, how to include the curation of process there, and what is possible in modeling tissues and continuum mechanical sense of a musculoskeletal system there. This is another application where it might play a big role is the fitting of prosthesis. So that's basically squeezing it together and where you have these kind of uh, high stress concentrations and the fluid ones, you typically get also edemas and uh, tissue damage. And with that, I want to thank you very much um, for your attention. And I think I still stay from time, not much time maybe for questions, but uh, happy to answer it offline as well. Thank you very much. All right, virtual applause. Thank you uh, for the talk. Um, I don't know whether it was just me, but unfortunately it was a little bit difficult to understand the audio all the time, at least for me. But I, the slides were very nice, so I, that was really nice uh, to, to follow in that case. Um, we do have a minute for uh, a question. Does anyone have a question to ask? I would have, but I can get it. 
Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, really, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, yes. I find your approach very, very interesting, especially for the biomechanical system side. But we also have uh, the biological side, for instance, for the bones. We know that it's influenced also by a cell, prop, uh, by the osteocyte, osteoblast, and osteoclasts, which should be covered. Are you already going this direction? In the, on the modeling side, we did, but it's getting very complicated, also from the numerical. It's a porous media. This interaction yes. with cell, they, they react, yes. they send the pressures and change the, yes. uh, the growth. Have you uh, gone in this direction too? Then now uh, we are happy to have a free phase material working and discretize it and the injection of a bigger area. Uh, I think that's a computational challenging problem as it is already. Uh, what we have done is in the exothermic uh, reactions, basically, that's where we put uh, some kind of kinetic in, uh, equations in there, but not for the osteoclast and osteoclast. We try to do that for the uh, regulation of the T's, but it's very complicated free boundary problem. Yeah, it, it is Numerical. indeed. I know what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> I think we have to leave it there, so we have to continue with the, with the program. Thank you very much, Professor Wörle, for the very nice talk, and for ever, yeah. uh, to everyone for attending. And I think we will continue here with uh, a pitch that will hand over to, to um, the person in charge. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.